If this is your first time listening, you might want to go back and start with part one of this patent series, which will bring you up to speed into the peacetime era between the world wars, where part two picks up. And by the way, the subject of this episode was a blunt and sometimes vulgar and insensitive person, um, especially by today's standards. So because I'll be quoting from him, it should be expected that there will be some rough language. So this is an official language warning. I, tr- I try to avoid being gratuitous. I don't want to present a false image of the man either. If this type of language is a problem for you, then now is the time to tune out. For everyone else... I'm not going to spend much time here with an intro, other than a reminder to turn your volume up for Dario's expertly crafted version of the Overture of 1812. It's a piece of music as epic as the man we're learning about. That man is Patton, the Force Multiplier. Peacetime did not come easy to Patton. The Great War was now behind humanity, and the colonel from California was probably the only one upset about it. And so he curmudgeonly passed his time by further developing theories of tank combat, now with using first-hand experience as a guide. It was in this study when he came to a groundbreaking conclusion. The tanks must be separated from the infantry. It slows them down and hampers their full capability. They must be allowed to move on their own. They must be their own core. To Patton, the tank was the new cavalry, the new mounted knight, a force capable of moving at lightning speed and throwing punches deep behind enemy lines. They could change the tide of battle in an instant by shattering the enemy front in two. Biographer Alan Axelrod points out that as Patton was developing these theories of tank combat, German military thinkers were already coming to the same conclusions. Conclusions that ultimately manifested as the Blitzkrieg. It was Patton's development of tank combat that allowed the American army, perhaps more so than any other ally, to recognize and respond to German lightning tank tactics when they saw it. It was during the peacetime, between wars, that Patton met another tank disciple and West Point graduate, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The two became friends immediately and engaged in correspondence discussing all manner of modern warfare. Despite making friends with the soon-to-be Allied commander, Patton made enemies too. One superior said that he was, quote, "...invaluable in war, but a disturbing element in time of peace." End quote. In July of 1932, protesters had gathered on Pennsylvania Avenue outside of President Hoover's White House. 
The protesters came to be known as the Bonus Army, dubbed so because there were tens of thousands of World War I veterans who had been issued bonus certificates for their service. But the catch was the certificates were not redeemable until 1948. With the Depression leaving most of these veterans unemployed, they didn't feel like waiting until they were in their 50s or their 60s for compensation. They wanted, or rather, they needed that money now. Like I said, the Bonus Army numbered in the tens of thousands, and Herbert Hoover had fairly legitimate concerns that an insurrection was looming. So he ordered General Douglas MacArthur to have the streets cleared. MacArthur then ordered Patton and his men to fix bayonets and fire tear gas into the crowds of destitute veterans. Patton at first refused the order, knowing that their demands were legitimate, but when pressed, he could not refuse a direct order. And so he personally led the march of 600 cavalrymen against the men who he served with in the Great War. In his journal, he loathed MacArthur's tactics and found the whole operation, quote, distasteful. Peacetime was deteriorating Patton's personal life, too. He had become unfaithful to Beatrice, and worse yet, he made little secret of the affair, often publicly bragging about it. Most shocking was that the young woman who had gained his attention was Beatrice's own niece. Over time, Patton came back to Beatrice with a contrite heart, and somehow they reconciled. Peacetime was proving to be lethal to Patton's personal and professional spirit. Having tasted the glory of war, idleness was eating away at his core. He needed a war, and he knew it. He even acknowledged this macabre desire in his journal entries. Then, suddenly, all of Patton's prayers were answered. Hitler invaded Poland. The army, knowing that they would be involved in this new world war one way or another, gave Patton the mission of overseeing the 2nd Armored Division. They needed the tanks to be ready for combat against the Nazi war machine, and Patton wasted no time in whipping these boys into shape. As usual, they were required to adhere to military codes to the letter, and he corrected them for the slightest infraction against procedure. And yet, he praised their valorous soldiers. He spoke to them as if they were all romantic warriors from some Homeric tale of old. As for the tanks, he restructured the large, clunky divisions into smaller, flexible units capable of operating independently of each other. And he sent them into the training field and personally oversaw the execution of his tactics. As he drilled, Patton was everywhere and demanded visibility. He painted the gun turret on his jeep red, white, and blue, and he added a yellow cavalry stripe. To his vehicle, he also affixed a siren that would announce his arrival on the battlefield, as well as an oversized placard clearly displaying the two stars of a major general, a rank he had recently been elevated to. Of his bizarre yet effective style of leadership, Alan Axelrod says, quote, Perhaps no modern American military commander has been more haunted by personal demons than Patton. A combination of impulsiveness, reckless personal behavior, feelings of worthlessness, and outright depression. Yet before the officers and men of his command, he never allowed himself to appear as anything other than supremely self-confident and confident of each of them. Beset by myriad doubts, Patton never allowed his subordinates to doubt him or themselves. His message was never we must succeed, but always that we will succeed. Imbued, however imperfectly, with the consciousness of his own destiny, Patton strove to inoculate everyone else in a similar sense. When he spoke of combat, he spoke viscerally of blood and guts, but he also emphasized that blood and guts had to be mastered by the intellect and put into the service of the great new weapon they now possessed, the tank. End quote. To better analyze his tank tactics in real time, Patton purchased a light plane, learned how to fly it, and then from the sky directed his men's movement. But this was more than just a fun way of watching tank training. From this perspective, Patton instantly discovered the absolute necessity of air support for the tank corps. A few planes, armed with explosives, could stop the corps literally in its tracks. They were also invaluable reconnaissance. Soon war games were arranged for all the generals readying their troops for Europe, and they were given a huge expanse of land to operate. Patton and his tanks dominated the field, and his winning tactic was a 400-mile dash around his enemy flanks, arriving at their rear and encircling them. The losing generals accused Patton of cheating, claiming that he had left the designated boundary of the battlefield, and that further, when he ran out of gas, he refueled at a civilian gas station at his own expense. George Patton didn't deny the accusations, and only reiterated the time-tested maxim that in war, there are no rules. <laughs> 
Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall heartily agreed with Patton and awarded him the victory. Another set of war games soon followed, and this time Patton was up against a general who, years earlier, tried to have him ejected from a polo match. Patton decisively won these games by capturing the commander in the field. After the war games, the U.S. military had all but confirmed the developing strategy of attacking Europe, first from the soft underbelly of Africa. And so, in preparation, Patton trained his men in the sweltering heat of the California desert. Finally, he received word that he would be leading part of the invasion force into Africa. Before leaving, he wrote to Beatrice, quote, All my life I have wanted to lead a lot of men in a desperate battle. I am going to do it. End quote. On October 28, 1942, Patton sailed from Norfolk, Virginia with 24,000 men aboard 100 ships. To pass the time and feeling a desire to understand the Islamic soul, he read the entire Koran. When made privy to more operational details of the invasion, Patton became discouraged that in most cases the British would be getting more prominent roles than the Americans. Quote, it is very noticeable that most of the American officers here are pro-British. Even Ike. I am, repeat, not pro-British. On the morning of November 8th, North Africa, defended by the Vichy French forces, those still loyal to the Nazis, began to fall to the Allies. The coast of Algeria, as well as Morocco, under attack from Patton, fell quickly. His presence on the battlefield was as expected. When witnessing some of his men digging foxholes, he began cursing and kicking and telling them that to dig a foxhole is to dig a grave. As Patton's army attacked Casablanca, the French forces surrendered on November 11th. It was also Patton's birthday. His invasion of Morocco was swift, decisive, and brilliantly executed. Yet he found other generals receiving promotions before himself. Writing to Beatrice about these disappointments, he said, quote, Sometimes I think that a nice clean death would be the easiest way out. End quote. This rabid jealousy only led to more bitterness. He went so far as to outright accuse other generals of having British interests over American. When Churchill and Roosevelt visited Casablanca and complimented Patton on his abilities as a host, he responded, quote, I'd rather be fighting, end quote. Shortly after this, upon finding out that the British would lead the next major offensive in Tunisia, Patton lamented that the Americans have, quote, sold our birthright, end quote. But his spirits were greatly lifted when he found out that Sicily would be the next invasion target. Axelrod points out that it appealed to Patton's sense of history. He could not refuse an opportunity to march in the footsteps of Hannibal and Scipio Africanus and Belisarius of Byzantium. But the Americans had yet to fight any actual Germans who were busily consolidating their African units in Tunisia under Field Marshal Rommel. On February 14th, Rommel began an offensive against the Americans that culminated in the Battle of Kasserine Pass. There, Rommel decimated the American forces, killing over 3,000 and destroying more than 200 tanks. The damage was even greater for the American morale. In their first fight against the Nazis, the Americans barely even shown up. British condescension of the Americans became commonplace. Ike relieved the commanding general of the U.S. Second Corps, and on March 4th, Patton received a phone call from the Allied commander. U.S. Second Corps was now his. But Ike knew Patton well. He had long been his friend, and he was well aware of his talents and his faults. And he gave him the order of rehabilitating the defeated corps to turn them into true combat soldiers. But he also reminded the general, quote, about personal recklessness. Your personal courage is something you do not have to prove to me. And I want you as a corps commander, not a casualty, end quote. And so Patton received leadership of a corps that was, as Axelrod said, sloppy, demoralized, and unsoldierly. And he had one week to get them battle ready. He turned the corps upside down. Every military uniform was to be clean, pressed, and spotless upon inspection. Every single military courtesy was demanded with zero exceptions to protocol. It soon became a common saying in the army that you could tell a Patton man just by looking at him. Once the rubrics of soldiering were instilled, next came combat tactics and indoctrination in warfare, as Patton saw it. He began to give them speeches about the attitude of the soldier in combat, and he wanted them to be killers. Or as Axelrod says, quote, he did not want them to die for their country, but to kill for it, end quote. On March 17th, Second Corps met Rommel's advance and stopped him cold 
During the battle, one of Patton's subordinate generals failed to advance. He complained of being stuck in the mud and unable to do anything about it. Patton, who didn't consider being stuck in the mud a reasonable excuse, relieved him of his command. Forward. Always forward. Nothing else would suffice. Though he had defeated Rommel in combat and turned Second Corps around, during the battle it was clear that Allied air cover was seriously lacking. The Germans controlled the skies. Thus, General Patton and Allied Air Command exploded in a public dispute, with each side accusing the other of excuses for their inability to perform. To quell the dispute, three Allied Air Command generals met Patton at his African headquarters to discuss the issue. During the meeting, the Luftwaffe swept in and attacked the very building that they were in. Afterward, Allied Air Command retracted their statements and promised more support. Eisenhower and Marshall poured praise on Patton for his rehabilitation of Second Corps, but Patton was not as pleased as they were. He saw the Second World War as being too political, that Americans were more concerned about offending people rather than glory. Quote, As I gain experience, I do not think more of myself, but less of others. Men, even so-called great men, are wonderfully weak and timid. They are too damned polite. War is very simple, direct, and ruthless. It takes a simple, direct, and ruthless man to wage war. Sometimes, I wonder if I will not have to laugh at myself for writing things like the above. But I think not. End quote. With Africa firmly in the hands of the Allies, a question now loomed for Patton. Who would be the conquerors of Sicily? The Americans or the British? For weeks, the Allied generals argued and nitpicked each other's plans, and Patton, for the most part, stayed out of the debate, though he did have his opinions. Finally, British General Bernard Montgomery cornered Ike's chief of staff in the laboratory, breathed on a mirror, and drew up the invasion plan for Sicily. He proposed to lead the invasion with Patton's armored divisions, offering flanking protection. To Patton's disgust, Ike agreed to the plan. Quote, This is what you get when your commander-in-chief ceases to be an American and becomes an ally. End quote. In his own private journal, he wrote the following words of encouragement for himself. Quote, the thing I must do is retain my self-confidence. I have greater ability than these other people, and it comes from, for lack of a better word, what we must call a greatness of soul based on a belief, an unshakable belief in my destiny, end quote. Patton hid his dissatisfaction from his staff and his soldiers, thinking it unbecoming of a proper soldier. Instead, he did what he did best. He prepared his soldiers for combat, this time in Sicily, telling them, quote, When we land... We will meet German and Italian soldiers, whom it is our honor and privilege to attack and destroy. In landing operations, retreat is impossible. To surrender is as ignoble as it is foolish. The glory of American arms, the honor of our country, the future of the whole world rests in your individual hands. See to it that you are worthy of this great trust. End quote. The Sicily landing took place in the pre-dawn hours of July 10, 1943. The general stepped off of his boat and waded through the waters with his men in a freshly pressed uniform, necktie, and polished boots and helmet. He immediately found himself in the place he loved, the place Ike demanded he not go, the heat of battle. There, among the shelling and explosions, he stood tall, barking direct orders to his men. He made it clear that he was offering himself as a target for the Axis powers. He showed his men that he was not afraid of death, and it gave them courage. When there weren't enough men to lay mortars, Patton, a two-star general, personally stepped in to assist, spurring his men to, quote, kill every one of the goddamn bastards, end quote. As I mentioned, the Allied plan for Sicily was for Patton to offer flanking support to the main British offensive under General Montgomery. The key to this offensive was capturing the city of Messina. The fall of Messina would be the fall of all of Sicily, and then a launch pad for invading the mainland of Europe. But what Patton decided... What no one else had even begun to comprehend, not his staff, not his superiors, not even Generals Ike, Montgomery, or Marshall, was that Sicily was a race, a race against Montgomery, a race towards Messina. As Monty got bogged down with heavy German resistance, Patton's army steamed forward, conquering Palermo, the capital of Sicily, on July 21st. On this march toward Palermo, Patton received an order from his superior, British General Alexander, demanding that he slow down. Patton's chief of staff first received the message, but knowing that it was not something that his beloved general would want to hear, the chief of staff allowed the orders to get lost in desktop paperwork and then later claimed the message got garbled in communication. Patton's unrelenting and seemingly illogical push for speed in Sicily made him a few enemies in the Corps. 
They simply didn't see the value in such speed. But Patton often retorted that speed saved lives. Quote, This is the value of history. I have a sixth sense in war, as I used to have in fencing. I am willing to take chances. End quote. Messina fell to the American army on August 16th at 10 p.m. Almost everyone was quietly critical of Patton, critical of his tactics, but not his results. And Patton, however, was quite pleased with himself, saying that his, quote, campaign will go down in history as a damn near perfect example of how to wage war, end quote. But he also cast praise upon his soldiers, quote, soldiers of the Seventh Army, born at sea, baptized in blood and crowned with victory in the course of the 38 days of incessant battle and unceasing labor, you have added a glorious chapter to the history of war. You have killed or captured 113,350 enemy troops. You have destroyed 265 of his tanks, 2,324 vehicles, and 1,162 large guns. But your victory has a significance above and beyond its physical aspect. You have destroyed the prestige of the enemy. Your fame shall never die, end quote. As deep as his love was for the front lines of battle, deeper still was his reverence for the field hospitals housing the injured and the dying. To these places, Patton paid frequent visits. In one day, according to his journal, he, quote, pinned some 40 purple hearts on men hurt in an air raid. One man had the top of his head blown off, and they were just waiting for him to die. He was a horrid, bloody mess, and it was not good to look at, or I might develop personal feelings about sending men into battle. That would be fatal for a general, end quote. One soldier in the hospital who was suffering from a fever, but by all appearances was uninjured, told Patton that he just couldn't take battle anymore. Overwhelmed with disgust, Patton smacked the soldier across the face with his glove. For Patton, the soldier embodied cowardice, something he himself had worked to overcome, and his emotions overtook him. Two days later, Patton gave an order to his field doctors not to admit on account of fatigue. About a week later, Patton encountered another soldier in the field hospital who was apparently suffering from fatigue. Patton didn't know it, but the soldier was reluctant to leave his men, who, clearly surmising that something was wrong with the man, they sent him away from the front. Patton came across this man in the field hospital sobbing to himself. When the general asked him what was wrong, the young soldier, with tears flowing, said it must be his nerves. Patton responded, quote, Your nerves? Hell, you're just a goddamn coward, you yellow son of a bitch. End quote. But the soldier could only continue crying in response, so Patton slapped him across the face. Quote, I won't have these brave men here who have been shot at seeing a yellow bastard sitting here crying. End quote. Patton slapped him again, knocking his helmet clear across the tent, then turned to the admitting officer, quote, Don't admit this yellow bastard. There's nothing the matter with him. I won't have the hospitals cluttered up with these sons of bitches who haven't got the guts to fight, end quote. Patton then turned to the soldier, quote, You're going back to the front lines, and you may get shot and killed, but you're going to the fight. If you don't, I'll stand you up against a wall and have a firing squad kill you on purpose, end quote. Patton then reached for his pistol as the doctors rushed the soldier out of the tent, quote, In fact, I ought to shoot you myself, you goddamn whimpering coward, end quote. Fear was something Patton could not tolerate in himself. Thus, when he perceived it, rightly or wrongly, it was reprehensible to him, to his very nature. He could not stand to see his men succumb to the thing that so terrified him. He even wrote a poem about it. Quote, I spare no class, nor cults, nor creed. My course is endless through the year. I bow all heads and break all hearts. All owe me homage. I am fear. End quote. When news of this incident reached Ike, he came down hard on Patton. Ike had even received a letter from an angry military mother about this general's behavior, but Ike reluctantly stood by Patton. Quote, you are quite right at being incensed that such acts as Patton's could occur in an American army, but in Sicily, General Patton saved thousands of American lives. By his boldness, his speed, and his drive, he won his part of the campaign by marching more than he did by fighting. He drove himself and his men almost beyond human endurance. Because of this, he minimized tragedy in American homes. I decided that Patton should not be lost to us in the job of winning the war, even though the easy thing for me would have been to send the general home. I hope that, as a mother of two American soldiers, you will understand. End quote. 
Because of the universal outrage of the slap heard around the world, Patton made the decision to offer a public apology to his entire corps. With all eyes on their general, Patton said, quote, I thought I would stand here and let you see what a son of a bitch looks like, and whether I am as big a son of a bitch as you think I am, end quote. His soldiers ate it up, but as far as Allied command was concerned, he was still in the doghouse, and it couldn't have been at a worse time, for the invasion of Europe was being planned now without Patton, as he was stuck idle in Sicily. The Germans, however, viewed Patton as the single most capable general the Allies had. Their fear of him had grown into an obsession. Where was Patton? What army did he command now? What was his next move? They were utterly convinced that he would be the only one trusted with the European invasion. Little did they know that he was on the verge of being relieved from duty. In January of 1944, Patton was finally summoned to meet Eisenhower in London. Ike needed to form a new army to assist with the coming invasion, and Patton was by far the best man for the job. He would be tasked with forming the Third Army and mold the men to be professional soldiers, fit for combat in the European theater. Patton was exuberant, and he summoned all his loyal staff officers and put them to work immediately. He even purchased an English bull terrier that he named William the Conqueror, although later, when the dog proved to be scared of explosions, he renamed him Willie. It's hard to blame the dog. Nonetheless, Willie went on to become something of a mascot for the men of the Third Army. What Patton now needed were officers that were molded in his own image, who could each take a group of men and train them the way Patton demanded. To these officers, he said, quote, Lead in person. An officer who is not dead or severely wounded has not done his full duty. Visit the front daily. Observe. Don't meddle. Praise is more valuable than blame. Visit the wounded frequently and award decorations promptly. Get enough rest, for fatigue makes cowards of us all. Plans should be simple and short and executed by the people who make them. Intelligence is like eggs. The fresher, the better. I can assure you that the 3rd United States Army will be the greatest army in American history. We are going to kill German bastards. I would prefer to skin them alive, but gentlemen, I fear of some of our people at home would accuse me of being too rough. End quote. Listening to Patton give one of his many speeches like these, a soldier in attendance later recounted, quote, We stood transfixed upon his appearance. Not one square inch of flesh was not covered with goose pimples. It was one of the greatest thrills I shall ever know. That towering figure, impeccably attired, froze you in place and electrified the air, literally hypnotizing us with his incomparable, if profane, eloquence. When he had finished, you felt as if you had been given a supercharge from some divine source. Here was a man for whom you would go to hell and back. End quote. But Ike wasn't ready to send Patton anywhere just yet. As the Third Army was being formed, the Allies were playing a shrewd game of misinformation with the Germans. They knew the German command feared Patton most of all, so they played into those fears. They let it leak out that Patton would in fact be leading a European invasion, and not at Normandy, but at Calais. And so an entire fictitious army was built around Patton, and with help from Hollywood movie studios, they fabricated fake aircraft and tanks that the Germans could spy upon from above. Patton himself was ordered to keep a low profile, an order which he failed at magnificently. He gave a speech at an event arranged by the women of Knutsford, England. And in his speech, he was quoted to have claimed that together, the English and the Americans were destined to rule the world, leaving the Russian allies out of the equation. The faux pas was enormous, and soon, once again, stateside politicians were calling for the Big Mouth General's removal. Eisenhower was nearly done with Patton. He deferred to Chief of Staff Marshall for guidance. Marshall left the decision for removal in Eisenhower's hand. For Patton, he could barely even comprehend this scandal. The sensitivities of a complex military alliance from major world powers just didn't sync with his way of thinking. When Ike finally met with Patton, he recalled, quote, in a gesture of almost little boy contriteness, Patton put his head on my shoulder. This caused his helmet to fall off, a gleaming helmet I sometimes thought he wore in bed. As it rolled across the room, I had the rather off feeling that I was in the middle of a ridiculous situation. His helmet bounced across the floor into a corner. I prayed that no one would come in and see the scene. Without apology and without embarrassment, he walked over, picked up his helmet and adjusted it, and said, Sir, could I now go back to my headquarters? End quote. Two days after this painfully awkward meeting, Ike sent a note to Patton, quote, 
I am once more taking responsibility of retaining you in command, in spite of damaging repercussions resulting from personal indiscretion. I do this solely because of my faith in you as a battle leader, and from no other motive. End quote. Ike also sent Patton a public relations officer who would always be at his side and whose job it was to restrain the general from making any public statements ever again. Upon meeting the officer and learning of his responsibility, Patton laughed and asked him what Ike really told him. The officer replied, quote, He said that you were not to open your goddamn mouth again publicly until he said you could. End quote. But Patton could still talk to his soldiers however he wanted, and they loved him for it. As the war in France drew near, he reminded them that, quote, There's one great thing that you men can say when this is all over in your home once more. You can thank God that 20 years from now, when you're sitting around your fireside with your grandson on your knee, and he asks you what you did in the war, you won't have to shift him to the other knee, cough, and say, I shoveled shit in Louisiana, end quote. But D-Day came and went without Patton or the Third Army. Yet even as the Americans landed in Normandy and began to push into France, so great was the German high command paranoia of Patton that they believed the invading force was a ruse, that the real invasion was still coming at Calais by Patton himself. Ike's plan couldn't have worked more perfectly. By the time they realized they had been duped, it was too late. After what must have seemed like an eternity for Patton, he was finally summoned to France a month after D-Day. During his plane trip, he refreshed his knowledge of the Norman Conquest, a military campaign nearly a thousand years prior. Finally stepping off of his plane, a naval lieutenant who saw the arrival of Patton in France noted, quote, When you see General Patton, you get the same feeling as when you saw Babe Ruth striding up to the plate. Here's a big guy who's going to kick the hell out of something, end quote. France had something known as hedgerow country. It was a countryside of ancient stone walls and massive hedges that are essentially overgrown slices of forest and proved a formidable defense against invaders relying on motorized vehicles to carry troops and supplies. General Omar Bradley was charged with breaking out of hedgerow country but was stuck. He needed a way to punch through and open the roads that led to Berlin. He needed a man who could move an army faster than anyone else on the face of the earth. He reluctantly needed General George Patton. Once given the assignment, Patton took two tank divisions and plowed through Hedgerow Country, capturing all the necessary towns and bridges to give the Americans access to all of France. And he did it in four days. The Germans' worst fears were now realized. The Allies had gained a foothold in France. They had broken through the formidable natural defenses of Hedgerow Country. And Patton was now the tip of the spear. Alan Axelrod reflects on this turning point in military history, quote, This was precisely the moment highly mobile warfare was most needed and, at the same time, had finally become possible. Now at the beginning of August, the war in France was just the kind of war Patton had prepared himself and the Third Army for, and for which he was, by temperament and genius, best suited, end quote. Reminiscent of his massive sweeping maneuvers during the American War Games, Patton's 3rd Army and tank divisions were covering huge swaths of northern France at breakneck speed. And his minions, those, those officers made in the image of Patton, were now operating independently of his direct oversight, which is precisely what he wanted. By such devices, he was personally fighting multiple battles at once. His presence on the battlefield was multiplied and demolishing all German resistance. Hitler was fuming that his gains in France were crumbling away and demanded a counteroffensive from his generals. But little did Hitler know, or any other German general know for that matter, of a highly secret operation developed by the British known as Ultra. They were essentially decoding any German message that crossed the airwaves. And thanks to a heads up from Ultra, the Allies organized a defensive posture in anticipation of an offensive. But for Patton, going on defense meant what he called holding the enemy by the nose and kicking him in the pants. He set up deep defensive lines, drawing in the enemy, and then swept around the German rear with his tanks, trapping them. From Axelrod, quote, In just two weeks, Patton had led a massive advance from the Codentin Peninsula through Normandy, pursuing and encircling thousands of Germans while liberating a huge expanse of France from Brest in the west to some 250 miles eastward. End quote. The Third Army was crashing forward towards Germany, faster than the German engineers could blow bridges, always surprising the enemy with his speed and taking Troy and Reims and Chalon before they knew it. Finally, he reached the Moselle River. Crossing it, 
who had put the general within a hundred miles of the Rhine. To be the first Allied commander to cross that legendary border river was an intoxicating thought for Patton. But he was out of gas. He had outperformed his Allied logistical support. Frustrated, he complained to General Bradley that with 400,000 more gallons of gas, he could be in Germany in two days. Quote, It is terrible to halt, even on the Meuse. We should cross the Rhine in the vicinity of Worms, and the faster we do it, the less lives and munitions it will take. No one realizes the terrible value of the unforgiving minute except me. End quote. But Bradley gave Patton a direct order to halt due to resources needing to be diverted to Montgomery, who was tasked with taking out launch sites for rockets that were terrorizing England. Patton, however, suspected that the Allied command was jealous of the glory that he would garner by crossing the Rhine. Around this same time, Patton made a journal entry that, based on what we know about the man, must have shattered his spirits. Quote, at 0800, we heard on the radio that Ike said that Monty was the greatest living soldier and is now promoted to field marshal. I then flew up to the command post and worked on administrative papers for the rest of the day. End quote. Though he refused to let his soldiers see the side of him, Patton was depressed. His brilliant advance across France was stopped just before he could make history. His resources had been diverted to his competitor and his own superior had neglected to give him any attribution, and what's worse, a British general was lauded above himself. But Patton had other reasons for the dismal mood. He saw the Allies losing the initiative of the war. Summer favored conquerors. As winter drew near, so too did the short, gray, cloudy, cold, and wet weather. The going would be much slower, tougher, and deadlier. He just needed a little more gasoline. As Patton sat idle with the Third Army, General Hodge was permitted to cross the Rhine, dealing yet another psychological blow to both Patton and the Germans. As Axelrod tells us, quote, The Rhine was mythic country for the Germans, the sacred river of their heartland, and to cross it would surely signify to them the beginning of the end. End quote. By November, Patton was permitted to begin advancing again, but this time everything was so much slower. German defenses were far more fortified now that they had time to prepare, and the weather was now a critical factor. As Patton studied the map of the Western Front and analyzed the campaign eastward, he felt they were making a strategic error. So strongly did he feel this way that in his journal he said, quote, First Army is making a terrible mistake in leaving 8th Corps static as it is highly probable that the Germans are building up east of them, end quote. The static corps he's referring to was sitting idle just southeast of the Belgian town of Bastogne. Of this prophetic journal entry, Axelrod says, quote, Everyone in Allied command had the same maps, but no one except Patton seems to have sensed the danger near Bastogne, end quote. Even General Omar Bradley had determined the region around Bastogne to be a, a quiet zone where his green troops could be sent to gain low-level battle experience. The truth is that most of the Allied command felt strongly that the German army was finished. But Patton, who had just got done slugging it out for every foot against the Germans, felt that the fighting was too hard coming from an army that was finished. On December 16th, Hitler ordered his generals to launch Operation Autumn Fog, an audacious cold-weather offensive to penetrate the Allied front, break away into Belgium, and capture the city of Antwerp and its seaports, and thereby cut off critical Allied supply lines from the sea and split the Allies in half. Most of Hitler's command felt the operation was doomed, but Hitler insisted nonetheless. And so, at 5.30 in the morning, a massive artillery barrage exploded from the German lines across an 80-mile front, the Allies didn't know what to make of the barrage. They definitely weren't expecting a counteroffensive in the middle of winter. But the weather favored the Germans. A region called the Ardennes was engulfed in a snowstorm, and the heavy cloud cover made Allied air support impossible. The next day, as all German panzer tank units were moving forward, pushing back into the Western Front, the Allies still had not entirely comprehended the scope of the offensive. Part of the American 285th Field Artillery Battalion was surrounded and thus surrendered, expecting to become prisoners of war. They were instead lined up in a field and executed. Around 84 men were murdered. Elsewhere on this day, the cold and lethargic American troops were entirely surprised by the sudden appearance of panzer divisions. Entire battalions were captured, armored tanks were blown to bits, 
The prisoners, in many cases, were simply executed where they stood. About 6.5 miles northeast of St. Vith, 11 African-American soldiers surrendered and were subsequently tortured before eventually being executed. As all Allied forces were pulling back and giving up real estate, Patton's 3rd Army, now 40 miles south of Bastogne, was still moving forward. Always forward. Apart from the developing catastrophe of the German army bulging into the Allied front, another was developing. In Bastogne, the 101st Airborne was in the process of being entirely encircled by the German army. As Omar Bradley took stock of the situation, he realized that Patton, being the only general not pulling back, was also the only one who could save the 101st. So he picked up the phone and he called the general. Bradley only asked for one armored division, to which Patton reluctantly agreed, as he was in a slugfest with the Germans himself. But Patton's instincts were telling him that it would take more than one division to free Bastogne. Moving on those instincts, he ordered his staff to begin working up plans to retract entirely from the fight the 3rd Army was currently in, and to turn on a dime north to Bastogne. Axelrod notes that Patton is often accused of being impulsive, which he certainly was, but he was also a careful planner. Quote, he always took care to distinguish between haste and speed. For him, haste characterized spontaneous or at least inadequate planned operations. Thorough preparations made haste unnecessary and enabled speed, an operation carried out swiftly as well as efficiently. A big part of conducting operations at high speed was preparing for them in advance. End quote. Two days after the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge, Eisenhower convened with Bradley and Patton and the other generals at the front. Ike was determined to present the situation as an opportunity, not a disaster, but he was fooling no one. The German advance was nothing short of a full-blown crisis. Their army was on the brink of cutting off the Antwerp supply chain, which would force the Allied armies back westward across France for the remainder of the winter. Patton broke the tension of the meeting by saying, quote, Hell, let's have the guts to let the sons of bitches go all the way back to Paris. Then we'll really cut them off and chew them up. End quote. The remark was met with nervous laughter. Ike canvassed his generals at the table, desperately looking for somebody who was in a position to attack, someone who could save the 101st Airborne surrounded in Bastogne. Most of them said they would need more time. Bradley said little, and Patton said nothing. Ike then turned to George Patton directly and asked him when he could attack. Patton firmly responded that he could attack with three divisions in three days. An irritated Ike responded, quote, Don't be fatuous, George. If you try to go out that early, you won't have all three divisions ready, and you'll go piecemeal, end quote. But Patton reiterated, three divisions in three days. Again, some of the men in the room laughed nervously, unsure if he was serious or not. Such a maneuver would require him to pull his entire army out of the current battle with the Germans and turn 90 degrees to the north and march 40 miles through a thick, snow-laden forest without rest and launch a counteroffensive against an enemy making their final stand. What no one else in that room knew, however, was that Patton's staff was already mobilizing this exact effort. A little while later, when Bradley told Patton that even with three divisions it would not be enough to break the German lines, Patton slammed his fist against the map on the wall and said, quote, Brad, the crowd stuck his head in a meat grinder, and this time I've got hold of the handle. End quote. In Bastogne, it wasn't just the 101st Airborne. With them was also the 969th All-African American Artillery Battalion, as well as part of the 10th Armored Division. And not only were they surrounded by a ferocious German army, they were nearly out of food, medical supplies, and ammo. Nonetheless, these Americans held Bastogne. When the Germans requested the commander surrender, a Brigadier General named Anthony McLough, who was so frustrated by the situation, he just shouted, Nuts! and then returned his attention to the defensive effort. And so his subordinates sent a response back to the Germans, answering to their request for surrender with a simple word, nuts. The Germans had no idea what it meant. As promised, Patton and his 3rd Army attacked the Germans in Bastogne with three battalions in three days. But it was a fierce fight, and it soon became obvious to Patton that without air support, three divisions just weren't going to break through. And with an ongoing snowstorm and low cloud cover, air support simply wasn't an option. So Patton turned to a more divine tactic. He summoned 3rd Army Chaplain Monsignor James H. O'Neill and asked him if he had a good prayer for weather. Patton, unsurprisingly, isn't what most would call a pious man, but he did believe fervently that he had a personal relationship with the Almighty. 
When Chaplain O'Neill questioned Patton about the efficacy of such a prayer, Patton took his Catholic priest to church, saying he was, quote, a strong believer in prayer. There are three ways that men get what they want, by planning, by working, and by praying. Any great military operation takes careful planning or thinking. Then, you must have well-trained troops to carry it out. That's working. But between the plan and the operation, there is always an unknown. That unknown spells defeat or victory, success or failure. It is the reaction of the actors to the ordeal when it actually comes. Some people call that getting the breaks. I call it God. God has his part or margin in everything. That's where prayer comes in. End quote. The Monsignor, lacking a weather prayer to satisfy the general, took it upon himself to write one and delivered it immediately. Quote, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that, armed with thy power, we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Amen. End quote. The very next morning, on December 23rd, the weather conditions drastically improved and the Allied planes swept in with devastating bombing raids on the German supply lines to the rear of their position. Then P-47 Thunderbolts attacked the German troop movements on the road. Other Allied aircraft used the opportunity to drop in much-needed supplies and food and ammunition. A team of volunteer surgeons even flew in on a military glider to set up a makeshift hospital for the exhausted defenders of Bastogne. Recalling this day in his journal, General Patton called it, quote, lovely weather for killing Germans, end quote. On December 26th, the lead element of Patton's 3rd Army, Company D of the 37th Tank Battalion of the 4th Armored Division, broke through the German lines and reached the defenders of Bastogne. Patton's tanks had worked a miracle. The siege was over, and with it, by a large part, was the Battle of the Bulge. Patton could not have been more proud of his 3rd Army and proud of the privates who he deemed the heart and soul of the army, proud of his commanders and proud of his chaplain O'Neill, who he decorated with a bronze star, telling him, quote, you stand in good with the Lord and with soldiers, end quote. To his wife at home, Beatrice, he wrote, quote, The relief of Bastogne is the most brilliant operation we have thus far performed and is, in my opinion, the outstanding achievement of this war. Now the enemy must dance to our tune, not we to his, end quote. But, as is always the case with Patton, with victory comes disappointment. Ike ordered him to sit tight in Bastogne while Montgomery was given permission to advance towards Berlin. Lamenting to Beatrice, he wrote, quote, You may hear that I am on the defensive, but it was not the enemy who put me there. End quote. After the Battle of the Bulge, Patton received no message from Ike of congratulations, no words of praise. When Ike personally visited Bastogne on February 5th, he made no mention of the offensive. On February 10th, Ike asked Patton how many troops he could spare to give Montgomery, who was stalling once again against the Germans. Patton had had enough of yielding to Montgomery at this point, and he told Ike that he would spare none, and that he must be permitted to resume the offensive or else he would resign. Ike, knowing he could not spare Patton, capitulated to his demands, although only gave him permission to take positions of aggressive defense. Patton heard something else, quote, I chose to view it as an order to keep moving. Let the gentlemen up north learn what we are doing when they see it on their maps, end quote. March 1st, the German city of Trier fell to Patton, who was well aware that it had once fallen to Roman legions. After its capture, he received a message from HQ ordering him not to take Trier. He sent a message back, quote, Have taken Trier with two divisions. Do you want me to give it back? End quote. Finally, Patton reached the banks of the Rhine, but was unable to cross it because the Germans had blown all the bridges. British General Montgomery was also on the Rhine and had no way to cross. During the night of March 22nd, Patton's engineers quietly built a floating bridge and slipped the division across the river, beating Monty by a day to the other side. This emotional achievement for Patton spurred him on to give an equally emotional speech of genuine pride to his men. Quote, Thereby eliminating the practicality of all the German 7th and 1st armies, history records no greater achievement in so limited a time. The world rings with your praises, 
Please accept my heartfelt admiration and thanks for what you have done. And remember that your assault crossing over the Rhine assures you of even greater glory to come. End quote. Though these words were imparted to his men, in his personal journal, he was a bit more blunt. Quote, Drove to the river and went across on the pontoon bridge. Stopped in the middle to take a piss in the Rhine. End quote. As Patton's Third Army drove into the heart of Germania, he processed more than a million POWs, more than any other Allied army. They also discovered a salt mine converted into a vault 2,100 feet underground belonging to the Nazi party. When one of his commanders asked Patton what they should do, Patton replied, quote, Blow open that fucking vault and see what's in it. End quote. 4,525 pound gold bars millions in currency from all over the world, and thousands of priceless works of art looted from museums and private collections raided by the Third Reich. Patton was unimpressed. Quote, We examined a few of the alleged art treasures. The ones that I saw were worth, in my opinion, about $2.50, and were normally seen in bars in America. End quote. But they also found something far more sinister. Gold and silver dental fillings and eyeglasses, and jewelry taken from victims of the final solution. That very afternoon, Patton, Bradley, and Ike toured a liberated concentration camp. In his personal journal, Patton wrote that it was, quote, the first horror camp any of us had ever seen. It was the most appalling sight imaginable, end quote. He described seeing the dead still strapped to tables, hung on gallows, in the last stages of emaciation. He also described the dead who were recently dug up from their shallow graves and piled high atop railroad ties, resting on bricks where their torturers attempted to burn the evidence of their terrible atrocities. The plan did not quite work. As Patton wrote, quote, The attempt was a bad failure. One could not help but think of some gigantic cannibalistic barbecue. End quote. As tough as a guy as Patton was, the horrors of the Nazis were all too much. A soldier present for this morbid discovery recorded the general needed to, quote, go off into a corner thoroughly sick, end quote. As the war in Europe drew to a close, Patton met many disappointments. The Americans were not going to be awarded the capture of Berlin. That was reserved for the Russians. Patton was refused the capture of Prague, and Chief of Staff Marshall refused to transfer him to the Pacific Theater. In one of his final interviews with war correspondents, he was asked if the SS troops he had taken prisoner would be treated differently than his other prisoners. His response was, quote, No, SS means no more in Germany than being a Democrat in America. That is not to be quoted. End quote. When asked about how he felt about having the Soviet Union as an ally, he said, quote, I wonder how the dead will speak today when they know that for the first time in centuries we have opened Central and Western Europe to the forces of Genghis Khan, meaning Stalin. I wonder how they'll feel now that there will be no peace in our times and that Americans, some not yet born, will have to fight the Russians tomorrow or 10, 15, or 20 years from tomorrow. End quote. Soon after these remarks, Patton gave another speech calling the wounded the real heroes of the war, thoroughly insulting every single parent across the Western world who had lost a son to the conflict. The controversies created a whirlwind that was bearing down on Patton. In his response to his critics, quote, Now the horrors of peace, pacifism, and unions will have unlimited sway. I wish I were still young enough to fight in the next one, killing Mongols, end quote. Ike was furious with Patton for just about everything that came out of his mouth, creating fires everywhere that he had to put out. Patton's own letters at this time descended into conspiratorial worldviews that caused him further alienation in the army. With combat in Europe over, and Patton's own mouth a major liability, the time had finally come for Eisenhower to relieve General George Patton of his third army. Patton argued and cursed, but accepted his orders on October 7th, 1945. Before he stepped away from the men who he chewed mud with in Europe, he said to them, quote, The best thing that has ever happened to me thus far is the honor and privilege of having commanded the Third Army. End quote. Two months after being relieved from the Third Army, some of Patton's subordinates were looking for a way to lift the mood of their old general. 
just before noon on December 9th, they picked him up to go pheasant hunting. Patton sat in the back seat, watching the broken, war-torn streets of Germany pass him by. And he remarked under his breath, quote, How awful war is. Think of the waste. End quote. As these words left his lips, an oncoming military truck made a sudden turn to the left. Patton's driver attempted to avoid crashing by swerving hard to his left. The collision was minor, and everyone was fine, except General George Patton, who had gashed his head open on the glass partition between the front and rear seats. He calmly told the others, quote, I believe I am paralyzed, end quote. The general was immediately rushed to a hospital in Heidelberg, and upon seeing how nervous everyone was to be so close to this legend of a man, Patton calmed them by saying, quote, Relax, gentlemen. I'm in no condition to be a terror now. End quote. It was soon discovered that he had fractured and dislocated his third and fourth cervical vertebrae. Ike immediately ordered a military plane to fly Beatrice to Germany to be at her husband's side. In front of her, he was determined to be cheerful. When she left, he spoke to the neurosurgeon, Colonel Sperling, quote, Now, Colonel, we've known each other during the fighting, and I want you to talk to me as man to man. What chance have I to recover? Sperling said, It depended on how the next few days go. What chance have I to ride a horse again? Sperling said, None. In other words, the best I could hope for is semi invalidism. Yes, said Sperling. Thank you, Colonel for being honest. End quote. On December 21st, Patton had been paralyzed for 13 days now, and during this time not once it is recorded that he complained, or cursed, or spit, or exploded in anger, or even uttered a single rude word. Beatrice had spent the majority of the day reading to him before leaving his room to eat dinner. When she returned, her husband was dead. The official diagnosis was congestive heart failure, and pulmonary edema. It is not how the old man would have wanted to go out. In his own words, his preference was, quote, The best end for an old campaigner is a bullet at the last minute of the last battle. End quote. Perhaps Patton knew what would happen to a soldier who lived too long. Or as Axelrod says, quote, Dead heroes make the best heroes, because for them time has stopped and there is no more of the messy business of life to interfere with the collective cultural projection that is myth. The coexistence of passivity and aggressive activity, of surrender and victory, of mystical spirituality and bloodthirsty profanity in a military commander was difficult for Patton's contemporaries to accept and for the leaders of an army serving a rational democracy nearly impossible to tolerate. Although American history is in very large part a saga of war and warlike violence, Americans have never been entirely comfortable with their warriors and their historical reluctance to maintain a large standing army reflects a national revulsion against fostering anything resembling a warrior class. The very class to which Patton believed he belonged. End quote. Ike sums up Patton more succinctly than anyone. Quote, he was one of those men born to be a soldier, end quote. Yet for Patton, there was so much more depth, perhaps a, a mystical self-worth, beyond just being a soldier. When a British commander told him he would have made a great marshal for Napoleon had he lived in the 19th century, Patton replied, quote, but I did, end quote. In his own poetry, he espoused similar beliefs of reincarnation, quote, through the travail of ages, Midst the pomp and toil of war, have I fought and strove and perished countless times upon this star. I have sinned and I have suffered, played the hero and the knave, fought for belly, shame, or country, and for each have found a grave. So as through a glass and darkly, the age long strife I see, where I fought in many guises, many names, but always me. So forever in the future shall I battle as of yore, dying to be born a fighter, but to die again once more. End quote. Perhaps, though, the most fitting end to George S. Patton's story, that dyslexic little boy from California, is a single sentence he wrote to Beatrice when the conflict in Europe ended. Quote, 
another war has ended, and with it, my usefulness to the world. So that's it, everyone. That concludes my first 12 months of being a history podcaster. I cannot thank everyone enough who has listened and who has given me kind reviews and shared with their friends and family on social media. I also owe a big thank you to my patrons, Courtney, Kara, Mike and Joni, Peter, Aaron, Walter, Heather, Steph and Steven, and Joel, and everybody else who, if I didn't name your name, it's because I recorded this before I actually aired the episode, but I'll get you on the next one. I can't thank you all enough. You guys are awesome, and I really appreciate your support. Another big thanks needs to go out to all the amazing and incredible indie podcasters and enthusiasts out there that I've connected with. The list is too big to name, but to name a few, that's Kara from Time Travel Talks, Ben from Thugs and Miracles, Adrian and Renee from Dear World Love History, Thomas from History of Altawera, New Zealand, Arjun from Deep Into History, Jessica at Body Count, Bree at Pontifax, Peter at Badger State, and Elise from the Second Glance History blog, History Impossible, and many, many, many others. You guys all rock. I also can't thank my little sister Courtney enough for all of the artwork she's produced for the show. It's amazing. Now, stay tuned, everybody, because I'm not going anywhere. Season 2 is already mapped out and ready to launch. In a couple weeks, I'll announce some really cool news that I have coming down the pike with Season 2. So, check back around the 15th. That's when I'll release another Almost episode that'll probably be a recap of Season 1 and have some announcements that I plan on making for Season 2. And with that, I bid you all a very fond farewell. Until our next meeting. See you later.